Thank you very much. What we try to do for the next 30 minutes or so is to, and um, uh, we with me on the panel with the President of Somalia. Oh, President, you are not here. Uh, you have a substitute. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ethiopia, the uh, Commissioner for uh, Peace and Security of the AU, and um, uh, Minister yourself, Amani, President. Um, can we have the opening statement from you? No, please. Please, Mr. President. I know how time is pressing the, the conference, so I'm glad how things are going on. And uh, thank you, President Obasanjo, for inviting me to have. Much has been said on the African continent and how Africa is progressing on the way forward. I would like to emphasize the one important point that everybody who stood in this podium has mentioned, which is the, the youth in Africa, which is a basic. Africa, as has been said, is a very moving uh, continent in terms of economy and in terms of development. Somalia has been in a difficult situation for a long time. It's one of those, it's one country that has such a protracted, long, long time statelessness. And why Shabab is Somali? Shabab is an ideology-based organization, and ideologies have no borders and have no citizens. Why they are Somali is for one reason. In Somalia, there has been a territory that was not governed at all for a long time. This space has provided the terrorist groups free to recruit, free to train, and free to organize themselves not only in Somalia, but in other parts of the continent and the world at large. Without stable Somalia, the whole region of Horn of Africa will remain unstable. And by large, the African, con African continent, there are proofs and evidences that in some time, Boko Haram has been trained in Somalia and they went back to Nigeria to make what has been described by uh, Kofi Annan right now here. The terrorists are so linked together, they are so associated and so organized. We, the world, we need now to be so organized. One important point I would like to add, this is the role of the countries that are facing the scorch of the terrorism. How much the world give a chance to listen the, so, the local solutions, the local ideas. It has been reduced in the last couple of years, and experience shows that the world has reduced the tendency of imposing ideas from the outside. Local ideas, local organizations are more important, although they may lack capacity in terms of know-how, in terms of finance. Somalia has been given a good chance to do its own local solutions and has been supported, and that's what makes a lot of problems. Having firing bullets from 100 meters away from the state house in Mogadishu in three years back, today they are targeting the innocent and the soft targets of the civilians. Today, they are bombarding the hotels, the restaurants, 
the crowded places like universities and markets, while two years, three years back, they were attacking the state house, the parliament, the courthouse, and military installations. That shows the decline of their capacity in, in Somalia. The new phenomena of Daesh has, has been there in Somalia, but Daesh and Shabab, which is affiliated to Al-Qaeda, are in conflict. Maybe that is the so lucky enough Somalia to have that war between Al-Qaeda, uh, represented by Shabab and Daesh. I would like to bring the attention of our international friends and partners addressing the phenomena of youth in Somalia will make, will be a game changer in the whole. And this is what we have been requesting and what we are going to pre present in the high level partnership forum meeting that's going to happen in Istanbul by the end of the month. For him, sorry. You are no longer foreign minister. You were foreign minister before. Uh, I'm, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Current foreign minister. <laughs> okay. I thought I was the only foreign minister and uh, <laughs> was surprised. Yeah, thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank Ambassador Ishinga for uh, having the um, panel uh, on Africa in the main session. That was what we requested with President Obasanjo last year and uh, we're very glad that he responded. And thank you also for the next core group meeting to be in Addis, another Africa-focused um, uh, Munich Security Conference in uh, uh, Africa soil. Uh, having said this, um, uh, maybe one a bit of improvement for next year would be, uh, I think, because today is the last day, I don't see many participants. The house is almost half. So next year, probably we will have on the first or second day. Uh, Lindwe Masiboko. Uh, thank you very much, President Obasanjo. My name is Lindwe Masiboko. I'm from South Africa, and I'm the former leader of the opposition in the South African Parliament. Um, I was very happy that the former SG, uh, Kofi Annan, opened with a discussion about inequality and about youth. But I noticed that women are conspicuous by their absence in this conversation, especially when we talk about organizations, non-state actors like Al-Shabaab and Boko Haram. But my question is about inequality in particular. When we talk about inequality, it seems to be focused very much on economic inequality. Right. But inequality has an age in Africa. The average age of an African is 19 years old, but the 10 oldest leaders on the continent average 78 years old. We talk about young people in their absence, and we talk about e economic inequality, but we don't talk about representative inequality. In other words, young people are left out of decision-making, women are left out of decision-making, but increasingly they're not even allowed to go to the ballot box and choose their heads of state. And so we, you know, there's been a lot of talk about stability and democracy, but there doesn't seem to be any effort to condemn efforts by long-standing presidents and heads of states in Africa who try to renew their terms and continue to deny voice to the young people, to the women uh, who they should be representing, uh, using the excuse of stability, which I think is increasingly a weasel word that's used to cover up what its real meaning is, which is protecting the status quo. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much for this kind invitation. I see uh, um, the topic is the Middle East, and uh, I'd like to maybe be, offer a more optimistic note than the one we usually uh, read about or hear about. I believe that uh, our region is a dynamic region. It is a young region. It is an in intermediate region, both uh, historically between ancient Rome and the modern world, as well as geographically between the Orient and the Occident. It is a region that has tremendous resources, a lot of young people, which means a lot of energy. It is a region that is increasingly connected to the world. It is a region that has a lot of uh, wealth, a lot of entrepreneurship. It is a region that uh, sits at the crossroads of civilization between Asia, Africa, and Europe. And so it, it is a region that, uh, by any measure, should have the attributes for greatness. 
It is a region that historically has been connected to the world in every way, from the old Nabataean civilizations to the civilizations of Egypt and Babylonia up until the modern age. The problem, however, is that our region faces many challenges. A geographic location that has many friends in the world. Saudi Arabia is a nation that has a history of pragmatism and proportion and balance in both its internal as well as external policies. And it is a country that is that if it has one constant, that constant is change. Whether it's Egypt, whether it's Iraq, whether it's Sudan, whether it's countries in the Maghreb, to try to help them deal with their economic issues as well as deal with extremism and terrorism. And we will succeed. Again, I have no doubt. We don't have an ideology that we're wedded to. We have pragmatism that we adhere to and that we pursue our policies by. Daesh is a terrorist organization composed of psychopaths who have no religion and no morals. They attract other psychopaths. And, and it's a cult. And it will be defeated. But in order to defeat Daesh, we have to de deal with what I call the two elephants in the room. One of those elephants is Bashar al-Assad. We cannot defeat Daesh in Syria unless we bring about change in Bashar al-Assad. He is the man who helped create it by releasing radicals from his jails, by allowing Daesh to operate without attacking them, by even trading with them. He is the man that allowed them to become what they are. And unless and until there is a change in Syria, Daesh will not be defeated in Syria, period. We have an international coalition of which my country was a founding member that has been bombing Daesh in Syria for 15 months and it's still around. So when Assad goes, the fertile environment in which Daesh operates in Syria will be removed and we can deal with them. The second elephant in the room is the implementing the reforms that were agreed to in Iraq in 2014 that would bring the Sunni community into the fold, that would create an equitable system between Sunni, Kurd, Shia, Caldonians, all Iraqis. That also will, call, will pull the rug out from under Daesh in Iraq and allow the country and its allies to defeat it. Everything else we do is putting scotch tape on an open wound. We've got to deal with the source of it. Those are the two main sources. Yemen, I'm more optimistic about because the legitimate government of Yemen is now in control of three quarters of the country. The humanitarian assistance in the areas that are controlled by the government is flowing effectively. The humanitarian suffering that exists in the Houthi Saleh controlled areas is as a consequence of the Houthis in Saleh hijacking their people and starving them and laying siege on their towns in order to score political gains. But that too will come to an end. To see uh, faces from here because of the lights. Uh, I'm Chris McBlunt, I chair the Foreign Affairs Committee of the House of Commons in uh, London. Um, uh, Foreign Minister, I hate to raise another elephant in the room. Uh, with both you and the uh, Prime Minister of Iraq, and indeed His Majesty uh, King Abdullah before, all talked about uh, uh, Daesh being un Islam. Uh, isn't, and I'm quoting here from an article in the Atlantic by a friend, which you're almost certainly familiar with, the reality is that the Islamic State is Islamic, very Islamic. Yes, it has attracted psychopaths and adventure seekers drawn largely from the disaffected populations of the Middle East and Europe. But the religion preached by its most ardent followers derives from coherent and even learned interpretations of Islam. And the article obviously goes on to advise us to uh, base our strategy on countering Daesh with that understanding of its heart. And I invite you to comment on that. 
Every religion has perverts and psychopaths who try to hijack it. ISIS is as much Islamic as the KKK is Christian. Don't they have a cross? Don't they do everything in the name of religion and Christ? Don't they believe that Christ compels them to lynch and kill people of African descent? Can one really say that the KKK is a Christian organization? There are other groups that one can point to. There are other massacres that were committed in the name of keeping certain countries or region, regions clear of non-Christians. There are people like this also in the Jewish faith that have nothing to do with Judaism. There are people like this in the Hindu faith that have nothing to do with Hinduism. For anyone to argue that Daesh is Islamic is preposterous. In the Islamic faith, the Quran reveals that you have your faith and I have my faith. And you're free to practice your faith and I'm free to practice mine. What greater sign of tolerance and acceptance do you have than this? In the Islamic faith it says, he who kills an innocent soul is as if he has killed all of humanity. And he who saves an innocent soul is as if he killed, as if he saved all of humanity. What more, what better example of compassion and mercy do you have than this? So if you look at what Daesh says and you say it's in the scriptures, doesn't the Old Testament say an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? If somebody does it today, would you say they were Christian or they were Jewish? So I caution people because it seems to have become almost novel. Not novel, it's become, it's become the flavor of the day to try to read things into Daesh or into Islam that are not there. The Islamic religion and Islamic civilization was the civilization that preserved the history of Greek and Rome and passed it on to the West. Western civilization would not exist without the Islamic Arab civilization. The Islamic civilization and the Islamic Arab civilization was the civilization that connected China with Europe. So it was global. The point I made early on about being an intermediate civilization, this is what I mean. So if Islam was intolerant and Daesh represented Islam, would Islam have preserved Aristotle and Socrates and passed it on to the West? Would Islam have connected Eastern civilization with Western civilization? Of course not. So I urge you, all of you, to be careful when it comes to making generalizations or to accepting generalizations that have no basis in fact. Thank you. Thank you. Final question, is that Anne-Marie Slaughter? It is. Good. Hi. Uh, Anne-Marie Slaughter, the President and CEO of New America. Hi, Anne. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for addressing uh, the issue of women in your country. I think you are right to see that this is an increasing issue for many in the world, and it should be addressed openly. I just wanted to add, make sure I heard you correctly, because what I heard you say was that there is nothing in your culture that, that prohibits the, or that, that retards the advancement of women. Is that, did I hear that right? What I was saying is that uh, in our faith, at least that in, when it comes to some the issues like women's driving, that this is not a religious issue, this is a societal issue. When it comes to things, to issues like education, this is not a religious issue, this was a societal issue, but we dealt with it. And we went from no schools for women in 1960 to universal education to where today 55% of college students in Saudi Arabia are women. I can give you another statistic, but it would embarrass me as a Saudi male. More than 60% of graduate students in Saudi Arabia are women. Some of our top doctors and engineers and lawyers and business people are women. So the opportunities are there. It's not, the, the issue is one that is evolving, just like it is evolving in other countries. America, one of the world's great democracies, gained its independence 
my mathematics is not very good. 220 years ago? 1776, 250 years ago almost? It took 100 years before women were given the right to vote. It took another 100 years before a woman was elected Speaker of the House. I'm not saying give us 200 years. I'm just saying be patient. And when it comes to societal change, in every society, people tend to look at where they are, where they are now, and they think everybody should be with us. Again, I will quote America, maybe because I spent so much of my life there. America was independent in 1776. The Republic was founded, what, two decades later? It took almost 80 years before slavery was abolished. It took 100 years before there was a civil rights movement. And it took another three decades before you had, before you had real social, uh, racial equality in America. Things take time. Now, you hope that in the modern world with technology and with communications, this process is accelerated, but it takes time. And we must acknowledge this and accept this. We can't expect to rush things overnight. Otherwise, we wouldn't be who we are. Thank you so much, Mr. Minister. Let's give a hand to uh, Foreign Minister.